I learned two things in Cheyenne. One, that hucky dummy is baking powder bread with raisins. And the other, that love's labor is not always lost, even if you don't know how to use a gun. <laughs> Frontier Gentlemen. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun... He lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. I had spent a week in Chugwater with hyena Bob Saunders, who ran the Cheyenne and Black Hills stage station. Now, I was on my way back to Cheyenne to send off to the London Times one or two of the more choice stories he had told me. There was only one other passenger in the stage with me, a man in his middle twenties. He introduced himself as Tom Hart. He was well-dressed, and at first glance, I took him to be an Easterner. No, I was born in Kansas. Reared in Montana Territory. Now I call Wyoming my home. How about you? Uh, born in England? I'm trying to make a living writing... writing articles on the West for the London Times. Oh. You been in Cheyenne yet? Oh, yes. Well, how are things? Well, it, that's hard to say. I haven't seen too much of it. Three years since I was there. I guess the town's changed some. <laughs> Well, this road sure hasn't. <laughs> well, Cheyenne's thriving, I can tell you that. Yeah, I've heard. Big cattle interest. I gather you're coming back from the east. <laughs> These fancy dude clothes, huh? Yeah, I've been in the east and other parts. A man gets tired of drifting, though. Comes time to go home, that's where I'm headed. Cheyenne? Yeah, I made me some good money. Now, I figure to get married, raise a flock of kids. That's a worthwhile project. There's a girl in Cheyenne, Kendall. We've been writing. These ways up to a year back, I got a letter from her when I was in New York. I wish you luck. Thanks. You married? No. Well, they say it ties a man down, but I figure if a gal's got her mind made up for marriage... Might as well drop your rope on her, because if you don't, somebody else is going to. I see you have the the philosopher's attitude toward marriage. Well, I don't know about that, but I've been lone wolfing long enough. Carrie is her name. Carrie Hudson. Used to be a cookie pusher up at the Blue Star Cafe. A cookie pusher? A waitress. Oh. I'll tell you what. When we get in town, you come on up with me to the Blue Star used to have the best eats in town. I guess they still do. I'll be proud to have you meet, Carrie. We spent the rest of the journey discussing matters of both consequence and triviality. Hart had received no formal education, but his travels had given him a certain sophistication, and the time passed pleasantly. When we arrived in Cheyenne, I tried to persuade him that his fiancée would be much happier to greet him alone, but Hart would have none of it. He insisted that I accompany him, and so together we walked to where he knew the Blue Star Cafe to be. Charlie Bannister runs the place. Charlie looks like bad medicine. His thumb says he used to be a short trigger man, but it ain't true. By the way he looked after Carrie, you'd think she was his own daughter. I sure had to play it straight before Charlie let me start riding herd on the gal. Say, listen, you hungry? A little. You wait till you taste Charlie's hucky dummy. He used to be a range cook, and there's never been a man made hucky dummy the way Charlie makes it. Now, hey, that's funny. Huh. Looks as though it's closed. Well, it does for a fact. First time I ever knew the blue star closed. 
Do you see anybody moving around in there? No. Hmm. She's open. Hello, Charlie. Whoever you are, come on in back. You sure don't figure. Hey, Charlie, you old... What do you say, Tom? What? Charlie, this is a fellow I met on the stage coming in. J.B. Kendall. How are you? Hello, Charlie. What's happened? How'd you get like this? I guess you ain't heard. There was a shoot-up in here a year or so ago. Carrie. Is Carrie all right? When it was finished, the boys had done the shooting, robbed me, and I tailed it out. I ain't moved from the bed since, Tom. What about Carrie? She ain't here no more. Well, where'd she go? Ask Jack Feeney up to Holloman Saloon. I'm asking you, Charlie. And I ain't saying. You and me was friends, Tom. I just leave, keep it that way. Now, what's Jack Feeney got to do with it? What, Charlie? All right, I'll tell you. Carrie took a shine to him while you was gone. That's a lie. I told Feeney to leave her alone. There was word. I threw him out. Same night, he comes back with one of his boys, and they fill me full of lead. Well, wasn't this Feeney arrested then, Charlie? Sure, but it was his word against mine, and... Carrie took his side and swore at the trial it was someone else had come in and shot me up. Is she with Feeney now? I ain't seen her since that day. Hey, Tom, boy, while you're here, pump me a jug of water, will you? Old Doc Thorne says I gotta drink plenty of water. And Mrs. Carroll's been helping out, but she ain't showed up yet today. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll be right back, Charlie. Thank you. I ain't got the stomach to tell him all the truth of it. You'll have to find out sooner or later for yourself. She married Feeney. Oh? When? Yeah. Right before the trial. Guess it was partly my fault. I should have seen it. Gary getting lonesome waiting for Tommy and Feeney coming in here. His fancy spending ways. He runs a gambling in Holloman Saloon. Well, next thing you know, Carrie's looking cow eyes at him. Well, don't you think it'd be better to tell Hart now about the marriage? Say, listen, you keep an eye on him, will you? Tom's got a bad temper. He gets it in his head to start trouble. There's likely to be a killing. All the more reason to tell him then. This way, he'll go up to the saloon looking for her. Yeah. I guess you're right. It wouldn't be so good. Here's your water, Charlie. Is there anything else I can do for you? Yeah. Stay away from Holloman's saloon. I lied to you before, Tom. She's there with Feeney. They're married. Anything else I can do for you, Charlie? No, I reckon not. Hey, hey, come on back and see me if you've a mind to. I'd sure like to hear about your travel. I'll do that. So long. You take it easy, Tom. Uh, goodbye, Charlie. You, you take it easy, Tom. Well, I guess I'll be seeing you, Kendall. Where will you go, Tom? Not that it's any of your business, but I guess you ask out of kindness. I'm going up to Holloman's Saloon and have me a few drinks. Oh, well, mind if I come along? No. No, I don't mind. We walked down the main street. I knew it was pointless to tell him that trying to see his girl was the worst thing he could do to himself. I rather liked him, and I suppose that's the reason I went with him. He didn't say a word until we reached the saloon. Then he said, You go ahead, Kendall. I'll meet you in there in a few minutes. I got an errand to do first. Well, I'll come with you. I don't mind. I do. Just order me a bottle of whiskey. I'll see you inside. All right. Well, hello, stranger. You're a little early, but what's your pleasure? Cards? A dance? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm looking for Carrie... Oh, for what? Are you Carrie? Yes. Um, can we sit at the table? I don't sit with customers, mister. That's for the girls. You want to talk business, you can talk to my husband. A friend of yours is in Cheyenne. Tom Hart. Tom 
He's just heard about you. He'll be coming in here in a minute. I thought you ought to know. Thanks, mister. How, how did he take the news? He got it from Charlie. Well, he'll probably get very drunk. I imagine I'd do the same. He won't make trouble. I'll try to see that he doesn't. Has he said anything about me? Only that he was expecting to marry you. <laughs> right. I thought... It doesn't matter. Anybody got the price of a drink in his pockets, welcome. That goes for Tom Hart as well as the next man. You want a table, mister? Uh, yes, uh, a table would be fine. This way. What are you drinking? Oh, beer, I think. Uh, yes, and a bottle of whiskey. My husband, Jack, doesn't like him. I wouldn't want Tom to get hurt on account of me. Will you get him out of here if he's looking for someone to sharpen his horns on? I'll do my best. Thanks. Beer and a bottle of whiskey, mister. Beer and a bottle of whiskey. Well, where's the drinks? On their way, Tom. What's the gun for, Tom? She's right clean in China, ain't she? Sent me back $20. Put it away. Uh -uh. I bought it, and I aim to use it. As soon as I get drunk enough, I'm going to kill me a skunk called Feeney. In a moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. Fast with a quip, faster at making time with a beautiful girl, but fastest of all with a clue. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, will be along with his latest insurance investigation later today on CBS Radio. Get next to Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar on most of these stations. Now, we return you to the Anthony Ellis production of Frontier Gentlemen. <laughs> Tom Hart and I sat at a table in Holloman's saloon, and between us lay a brand new 44 revolver. After a moment, Tom picked it up and slowly rotated the cylinder. He didn't turn as Carrie came toward us, didn't look up as she put down my beer and Tom's bottle of whiskey. Yes, sir. It's a mighty pretty talking iron. How are you, Tom? Hmm? Oh, Carrie. Yeah, I, I heard you was here. Well, you're looking good. You know, back east, they, they drink a toast to new married folks. So I drink to you, Carrie. <clears throat> well, where's your husband, Mrs. Feeney? Jack's out. Don't make trouble, Tom. What's done is done. That's the way you see it, huh, Carrie? You never wrote. I didn't have to. You were my girl. I told you I'd be back, but you couldn't wait. I waited two years. You was in such a hurry, you had to get Feeney to put Charlie out of the way, too. That's hmm? not so, Tom. Charlie, he's lying in bed. He don't move anything but his arms anymore. Your husband did a right fine job. You ain't even been to see him since. That doesn't do much good, you know. She's not the same anymore. At first I thought she was, but she's not. She was a girl. A nice girl when I left. She got too much paint now. Looks like a honky-tonk woman. Finish your drink, we'll go. There's time. There's plenty of time. I want to have a talk with Jack Feeney. He shot up a friend of mine, you remember? <clears throat> you want to leave? It's all right, Kendall. You go ahead. I'll stay. You want a whiskey to chase down the beer? No, thank you. Do you know why I'm going to get drunk? I've got a rough idea. Yeah? How rough? Well, Tom, you know, you really haven't got any right to start trouble with Feeney. What about Charlie? What about him? The court said Feeney was innocent. Charlie says he did it. And if you shoot Feeney, they'll find you guilty. What will you prove? She said she was going to wait. She said she loved me. 
to me. Then I'll laugh. Love. That's why you're getting drunk. Then you'll be able to get angry without thinking. You talk too much. Well, you ask me. Where'd she go? Up the stairs. Hey, you figure she was lying. Maybe Jack Feeney's here. She's going up to tell him. I don't know. Well, I'm going to find out. No, I wouldn't. No, uh, sit down, Tom. Give me that gun, Kendall. Now, you sit down. You're not that drunk yet. And you're not going up there to start shooting. Give me the gun. No. You're bigger than me, but I ain't afraid to tangle with you. I didn't say you were. All right. I'm going up there without a gun. Oh, don't be a fool. Tom. Don't rile me, mister. Tom, she's married to him. You'll find another girl. Hey, where are you going? How come you're going up to me in my wife's room? I figured to find you there, Feeney. Well, Tom Hart. That's right. I stepped out for a while. If I'd known you was going to pay a visit, I'd have come back sooner. Have you seen my wife, Tom? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen her. Well, we'll have to get her down and have a friendly drink together. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting your friend. J.B. Kendall. Put her there, Kendall. Carrie, come on down. Hey, Lester, bring a bottle of champagne. I didn't come to drink with you, Feeney. I came to kill you. <laughs> well, sure, you can do that any time, but you'll have a drink first, huh? Here, sit down, boys. When'd you get back in town, Tom? Today. And I seen Charlie. Yeah? I heard about Charlie. You was too bad him getting shot like that. The way Charlie tells it, you did the shooting. Oh, poor fella. They say it made him a mite loco. Here's your champagne, Mr. Feeney. Uh, and here comes the prettiest little woman in Cheyenne. Sit down, Carrie. I hear you've met Mr. Kendall here and Tom. Yes. Well, it's like old times, except the thing or two has changed. I got me a new wife. What'd you get back east, Tom? I'm telling you something, Feeney. I had a gun, which a friend of mine didn't figure I was drunk enough or, or maybe sober enough to use. Well, I'm going out and get another one. And the next time I see you, I'm going to be using it. He sure is excitable, ain't he? You figure he's still galling over you, Carrie? What does it matter? What do you think, Kendall? I think that Tom Hart's in the mood for murder. Whether it's because of your wife or Charlie, I don't know. Jack didn't shoot Charlie, Mr. Kendall. I know he didn't because we were together that night. That's true. Must have been a couple of cowboys dropped into Charlie's place or robbed him, gave him lead poison, but it wasn't me. Why does Charlie say it was? That was at the trial, he said it then, too. Of course, my lawyer, he showed where it was dark in Charlie's cafe, and Charlie couldn't rightly tell who was in there that night. Charlie figured it was me because we'd had words the same day. I think I'd better find Tom. Now, nah, don't you go worrying, Kendall. You cool down. Besides, Tommy ain't no kind of a hand with a gun, and he knows it. If he comes looking for me, we'll take care of him. Which was exactly what I was afraid of. I spent the next hour going from one saloon to the next, looking for Tom. I couldn't find him. And so I went back to see the one person who I thought might be able to help. No, he ain't come back here. Took it bad, huh? Yes. Yeah, it's a trouble with that boy. Everything nice and easy with him. Never could figure what he was really thinking. But when he busted loose... Charlie, are you still positive it was Feeney who shot you? Sure I am. Well, Carrie says he was with her that night. She's lying. Why would she lie? Oh, well, don't ask me how come a woman does what she does. I think the one reason that Tom's going after Feeney now is a matter of pride. He doesn't want to back down. He'll use you as an excuse. I don't need any man to fight my war. Do you think there's a chance... Even a remote one that it was dark, that night you were shot, and perhaps you were mistaken about Feeney? Well, I guess there's a chance, but... Charlie, if I can find Tom, if he knows that, if you'll tell... Shh. Come on outside. 
Carrie. Is he here? No. I had to come. I don't want him to get hurt. I wanted to talk with him. Ain't much for you to say, seems to me. I made a mistake. I'm not making another. It was Jack shot you, Charlie. I lied for him. Uh-huh. He said if I didn't either he or his boys, he'd get you for good. He said he'd kill me, too. Then why'd you marry him? I had to. That doesn't matter now. We've got to find Tom. Jack sent two of his boys out looking for him. He wants to kill Tom. Why? I guess he knows. He's always known how I feel. And I'm going back to the saloon. You'd better stay here, Carrie. <laughs> Couldn't find him, huh? No. Well, he's probably sobered up by now. He'll be all right. Yeah, nice fella, Tom. Just a little too hot-headed for his own good, that's all. <laughs> well, I imagine when a man comes home and finds his girl married to another man, it can be a little upsetting. Sure, sure. And then seeing a good friend of his lying paralyzed, shot by the man who married his girl, likely to make a chap unreasonable. Even though he's wrong, yeah? I see what you mean. Then if... if he finds out that the girl's husband forced her to lie, and if he finds out that the girl still loves him, he'd be in quite a state. Yeah, that wouldn't be so good, would it? Hmm. Now, if I were the husband, I'd want to get rid of that fellow, say, a fellow like Tom, because my life wouldn't be safe for one minute. I'd send some men out looking for him with orders to shoot on sight. You got any more ideas along that line? Well, if... A man like Tom had a friend. The friend wouldn't want to see Tom, uh, bushwhacked, I think is the word. That friend is talking himself into a mite of trouble. <laughs> you think so? Then the friend would make another suggestion. Yeah. The husband is quite obviously a most unpleasant person. And the best thing he could do would be to give his wife a divorce so that she can live a decent life with Tom Hart. I'm back, Feeney. Yeah, I see you are, Tom. Candle, get away from me. I'm giving him a chance to draw, which is more than he did for Charlie. You heard him, Kendall. It's a fair fight. I heard. <laughs> Tom, look out behind you. I thank you, Kendall. No, not at all. Those are two of Mr. Feeney's chums. They've been looking for you. Now, Feeney, you were saying something about a fair fight. Now, listen, Tom. Draw. I ain't fighting with you. You ain't got the guts of a lizard. Draw. I told you, I ain't... That son of a gun! I ain't fighting. Well, I ain't... Sounded as though you broke his jaw, Tom. Yeah. Yeah, didn't it? I think Mr. Feeney will be leaving town. I also think he'll want to give Carrie a divorce. Oh? I thought you might be interested. Uh, incidentally, what would you have done if he had drawn on you? I don't know. Never thought about it. He probably would have killed me. <laughs> yes. I think he would. Well, I'll take care of the arrangements here. You better go over to Charlie's now. Carrie's waiting. Waiting? For me? Well, uh, I don't imagine it's for me. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin, Virginia Gregg, Jack Crucian, and Harry Bartell. Music was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentlemen. John Wall speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network.
There's a saying in the West that a cowboy is a man with guts and a horse. This is the story of one. His name was Slim. Frontier Gentlemen. Herewith, an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. I bought a horse in Cheyenne and was riding to Laramie in Wyoming Territory. I wanted a chance to really look at this grazing country and the thousands of heads of cattle dotting its plains. I rode north of the railroad tracks until the telegraph poles lining it were lost in a dusty haze. And I saw clouds, heavy and bronze, over the distant mountains. It was during the afternoon that I came upon the cowboy, a lean man of about 30, with a cigarette hanging from his lips. He was examining the right foreleg of his horse, and he looked up as I approached. Hello. Howdy. You need any help? That fool horse stepped in a gopher hole. Don't seem to be no spring, though. Ah. Fine-looking animal. He ain't a bad old buzzard head. Hey, you English? <laughs> yes. You a ranch man? No, no. A newspaper correspondent. Oh. But maybe if you was a ranch man, you'd be looking for a hand. Uh, I'm sorry. You don't make no never mind. I'm chassing over to Laramie. They girl get me a job on them new layouts I hear tells open up. I'm bound for Laramie myself. You mind if I ride with you? Well, I take it as real friendly. Quit it, you moon eyed son of a gun. Hold still. You think we'll have rain? Eh, don't feel like it. Of course you can't tell with them clouds. I've been on the range, and there ain't been nothing but blue up there, and wango, down she comes. Hail as big as your fist. I tell you, nature's a skittish beast. Ain't no how bridle-wise. Oh, incidentally, my name is Kendall. Slim, how are you? Slim. Been in these parts long? Oh, a few weeks. I came down from Montana Territory by way of Deadwood. That's so. They here, Wild Bill Hickok got plugged a while back in Deadwood. Yes. Yeah. I was there when it happened. That's so. Mm. What happened to feller that done it? McCall? Yeah, that was his name, Jack McCall. He, he was tried. The jury found him not guilty. That's so. Mm. Mm. Did you know him? No, just here. Oh. Uh. What do you write about in your newspaper? Uh. Well, I see people out here, their way of living... Kind of different in England, huh? <laughs> yes, it's quite different. Ain't no plains or mountains or rivers. Ain't nothing back east or in England like we got here. That's true. Don't figure how come a man went to live back here. Well, it's a different kind of country, a different kind of life. It's a... It's... Well, what? Didn't sound like no regular shooting. A old steel horse, I'll mash your sides in Seems to come from the hills. Yeah. Reckon someone's in trouble. Let's go. A range of hills, low-lying, somber, about a mile to our north. It was from that direction we heard the shots. Slim's horse easily outdistanced mine, and by the time I reached the first slopes, the cowboy had disappeared into a canyon. matter with him? Looks like he's been locking horns with some Indians. I was just riding up to him when it fell down. There's half an arrow in him. Oh. Broke off. Now, oh. take it easy, part. <laughs> Kendall, you better take his rifle. Keep an eye out. Yeah. No shells in it. Rappahoe. Rappahoe's got it. 
Where? Where? Where did they go? Up the canyon trail. <laughs> Wagon horses. Claire. Too bad. Too bad. He ain't gonna have no breakfast again forever. That's for sure. Well, what about the woman? Clara. Well, I guess she's still alive. Though maybe she'd rather not be. Indians keep captured white women around. Sometimes for hostage. Sometimes for other things. Well, do you think we'd have a chance of catching up with them? It might. Depends on how long a start they got. And how many. I'd kind of like to bury him first. Ain't fitting for a man to lie out in the open after he's curled up. Yeah, but it'll take time. What about the woman? It won't go no better or worse with her for the time. Oh, that ground's too hard for hand digging. we would have to make a rock grave. Tell you what, though. You start on it. I'll work up the canyon a bit, see if I can find signs. Now, if you hear three shots, come a-running. I'll do the same for you. Right. Wait, he, he may have some shells left for the Winchester. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's something. Eight of them. You better keep the rifle here. So long. I began the task of burying the dead man. From letters and a homestead deed in his pockets, I found that his name was Theodore Belding. There was also a tintype of a young, rather pretty woman whom I gathered to be his wife, Clara. It took the better part of 45 minutes to complete the grave, and it wasn't until almost an hour later that Slim returned. Well, I found the trail, followed it away up. There was four Indians in the wagon. They cleared the wagon and left it burned. Took the horses, though, and the woman. What are our chances? Can you shoot? I'm fair. Well, I ain't done any trailing since five years back, but we ain't got nothing to lose. Be getting dark by and by. We'll keep going till light gives out. Do you know this country, Slim? Not much, but a man can read a lot of things from places he ain't been. Here. That's where they stopped the wagon, see? Oh, you mean those double wheel ruts? Yeah. Must have ambushed him from over there. And the feller fell here. See the blood spot? Guess he made things hot for him for a spell. Were you an Indian scout, Slim? Yeah, for a while. Working with Custer. Oh? What do you think of him? For him, I got a can of cuss words and I best keep the lid on it. Yeah, we'll save our breath for breathing from here on. I want to be able to hear what there is to hear. We went on up the canyon, Slim reading the ground, or as he put it, following signs. For a mile or more, the trail was obvious, even to the most unpracticed eye. But after we passed the burned-out wagon, it became more difficult to follow. For another hour, we rode in silence. The sun was beginning to set. A cool breeze was sweeping down the canyon. Oh, oh no. You hear that? Could mean Indians made a camp. Those crows ain't flying. Figure they're sitting in the trees waiting for a handout. Uh... Unless they're feeding on carrion. It wouldn't be corn if there were. Sounds as if they're in those trees. See, just over the rise. Don't seem smart enough for Indians to make a camp this early. Or they know we're following and they're waiting for us. Shut your mouth, you glandered, spaven coyote. Hoss smells them. Now, we better tie the critters up. All right. Pull down that injured rubber neck, you Pale, pink, wall-eyed son of a gun. I'll skin you alive. Did you think that slim? That it might be an idea to work our way through the trees instead of along the canyon wall, huh? Yeah, I sure do. That old sun's right behind us. We make awful pretty targets. Keep in the shadows as much as you can. We'll just figure they got no weapons except in bow and arrow. That gives us a mighty advantage. You all set? Yes. Come on, then. And watch out for twigs and dry leaves. Walk soft. Ahead of us, through the trees and shrubs, lay the brow of the rise. We made our way upward until we were within ten yards at the top. That's when I saw a glint in the sunlight and a trickle of sand moving down the slope toward us. 
Get down! In a moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. Does that sound go with this music? Sure it does, when it's the sound of the shutters coming off the summer place in the woods, in the mountains, or at the shore. Only five more days from now, all America opens up the summer place as we swing into the three-day Memorial Day weekend, the first great outdoor holiday of the year. But first, what does your summer place need? In the refrigerator, on the kitchen shelves, the bathroom shelves, round the grill. Check now. Make a list now. Buy at your grocer's, your druggist, your hardware store. Then you'll be all set for that great big three-day weekend. And say, don't forget to have your portable radio checked and ready. Wherever you spend your happy holiday, there's a CBS radio network station to keep you posted on the weather and the news. And now we return you to the Anthony Ellis production of Frontier Gentlemen. Phew. You, you got good eyes, Kendall. I sure could feel the sawdust in my beard that time. Where are they? Well, one of them's between the boulders. A little to the right of the clump of alders. There, you can see the rifle sight. Want to try a shot with a Winchester? No, not yet. Only eight shells. We better save them. How many rounds you got for your gun? About 20. I got near the same. Say 50 rounds between guns and rifle. Not bad if it don't take too long. How many you figure we're shooting? Two, from the sound of it. Sharps repeaters, that's for sure. Well, we sure cut a big gut that time. Seems to me the only thing to do now is to wait until it's dark. There's no other way to get at them without being seen. I'm wondering what our chances are after dark. We ain't in the best position. Might be we ought to pull back down canyon, wait for morning before we pick up the trail. What about the woman? Well, if she's still alive, she knows there's help around. Right, man. Come out from trees. We make medicine. <laughs> Here's the Indian couldn't drive nails in a snowbank. He's trying to draw a fire. Locate us. Well, let him. You want to make medicine, Siwash? You come down here. Yeah, that came from the left, higher up. One of them must be in a tree. I think I can see him. Yeah, there's enough sticking out. No, gone now. Not on this side. Now there's one good Indian. Where'd you learn to shoot like that, mister? Odd places. What? I'm hit. Where? Oh, I'm hit in the arm. Oh, man, that hurts. Oh, that hurts. Let me see now, Slim. Oh, well, it ain't the gun hand, anyhow. Can you, you bind it up? Yes. Oh. I keep down now. White man! You want white woman? We talk. Maybe you pay gold to her back. Come down here. We'll talk. How does it feel now, Slim? Like a brand in irons inside. Well, there's not too much bleeding, though. That's something. I sure wish we had more cover. I feel naked as a painted cat laying out right, here. man. We come down talk. You shoot, woman die. What do you think? Yeah, we might have him buffaloed. Let him come. But watch him for tricks. They got a hundred. Come down. We'll hold our fire. Only one of them. Now, if he ain't a setting duck against that sky... There's two more, though. They must be with a woman. Yeah, maybe. Keep your eyes peeled. White man has been wounded. Huh. Indian has been killed? We are many. You are two. Climb down, Siwash. There were four of you, now there's three. I have a little knife. Chief of the Arapaho. Your little knife, a renegade dog who steals women. Little knife, not renegade. Fight with crazy horse. Little knife, not steal woman. Take woman. Like white man, take little knife land. Maybe kill white woman. 
Like white man kill Indian woman and child. The war is over. There's no more killing on either side. White man say war is finished. Not Indian. Quit your coyote around the rim, Indian. What about the woman? You give me your guns, rifle, and gold. I give her to you. I'll see you hung up to dry first. Not our guns or rifles, but perhaps some gold. How much? How much you got? A hundred dollars? Not enough. That's all there is? All guns and hundred dollars? No. I go back. Maybe you hear a woman die. Then you pay. Maybe you don't go back, Siwash. What about that? Like all white men, break word of truth. You speak of honor and murder with the same breath? We can kill you all. We wait for night, then we kill. I got a finger it's itching right now to wait for nothing. Little knife not afraid to die. Little knife, you... You took the belongings in the white man's wagon. Return the woman, and we let you keep it all. That and a hundred dollars in gold. You'll let Little Knife keep what he already has. Not a trade. Listen, you double distilled son of a gun. I seen a fair sized anthill down the canyon away. How'd you like to be staked out? I make good offer. Woman for guns and a hundred dollars. You say no? I go back now. Soon as the night. Then we take your guns and the gold. The Indian turned and moved back up the slope. For a moment, I had an uncontrollable desire to shoot. Then I thought of the woman, of what would happen to her. I lowered the rifle. We shifted our positions a few yards to the right, and we lay there, waiting. And the darkness settled into the canyon. Funny thing. Huh? What? We ain't heard no sound from the woman. Yeah, I was thinking of that myself. Wonder if she's all right. Well, should be better in three quarter moon tonight. Coming up in a while. They're gonna try something. It'll be afore the moon. Slim, I think we'd better sit back to back in case they circle around us. Yeah. I was just thinking. Wish I had me a drink of red eye right now. I know a place in Dodge. I tell you, Kendall, a shot of that tornado juice would draw a blood blister and a raw hide boot. <laughs> I'd like to see that. Mm, shucks, that ain't nothing. Feller what runs the saloon. He serves a free snake with every drink. Shh. Shh. Ah! That ain't what you think. It ain't no woman, that's an Indian. I know, I heard him before. They want us to think it's her. Are you sure? I'll show you. Hey, you crow bait dogs, which one of you's a squaw? See what I mean? Yes. One thing I don't understand. What's that? Why do they stay here? Why not ride off with the woman? Yeah, I figure there's two reasons. First, Little Knives probably left the reservation. He ain't got no particular place to go. Second, they want our guns. Indian will do a lot of fool things to get hold of a gun. Come to think of it, there's... There's something else. Oh? Yeah. Maybe they're low on bullets. You reckon? Yeah. It's quite possible. That's why they haven't attacked. Sure. Sure, they're using sharps for Peters. That feller's Winchester ain't the same caliber. So whatever shells they picked up in the wagon ain't worth a thing. In which case, we don't wait for them to attack us. Oh, uh, I know what you're getting at, but it won't work. Well, why not? I wouldn't be no good. Not with his busted wing. Slim, you stay here. Cover me with the rifle. Uh-uh. No, he'll hear you before you get ten feet up the rise. Slim, I'll admit that I'm a comparative greenhorn in your territory, but I've had the dubious pleasure of slitting a number of throats under similar circumstances in India. Those chaps didn't hear me. I'll take my chances with these Arapaho. Are you, you going to use a knife? Oh, well, if I have to, yes. <laughs> you sure are a funny kind of Englishman. Here, take your rifle. Mister, I sure hope you know what you're doing. <laughs> so do I. 
I crawled out of the hollow and inched my way up the slope. I had seen the flash of the Indian's rifle and knew his approximate location. In the direction I was taking, I planned to reach the top of the hill some yards from where I had last seen him. It was slow. Slow. Then, as I raised my head over the summit, I saw the great orange glow of the rising moon and silhouetted against it the crouching form of an Indian half turned from me behind a boulder. I drew out my knife. He died without a sound. Then I made out little knife and the remaining Indian. They were a few feet away, standing over a gagged and bound body. And in the constantly growing moonlight, I saw the chief bend down, the glitter of steel in his hand. This time I knew it would be a woman's scream I was going to hear. Little knife! It's all right, Slim. She's alive. She's all right. I cut the ropes, loosened the gag from the woman's mouth, and for a long moment she only looked at me. Then she began to cry. I carried her down the slope to where Slim was waiting. Then I went back to get the Indian horses and the things which had belonged to Belding and his wife. After that, Slim and I took her to Laramie in Wyoming Territory. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Jack Moyles as Slim and Lawrence Dobkin as Little Knife. Join us again next week for another report from... The Frontier Gentleman. Dan Coverly speaking. Today, here Jack Benny on the CBS Radio Network. One of the prettiest women I've met in the West was very nearly the cause of violence and carnage. And to this day, I don't think she knows why. Frontier Gentlemen. Herewith, an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. One of the first things I noticed in Laramie, Wyoming Territory, was the intense rivalry between that town and Cheyenne on the other side of the Laramie Mountains. One read the bitter attacks and counterattacks in the opposition newspapers. One heard it on the streets. At the time I arrived in Laramie, gold had been discovered in the mountains to the south, and there was great rejoicing in this fact, which threatened to eclipse Cheyenne's claim of superiority. In the interest of fair reporting, I decided to visit the mining area, with the idea of making comparisons between it and that which I had seen in Montana Territory. It was about midday when I saw the sign by the side of the trail reading Rotten Head Gulch, and a few minutes after that when I arrived at a cluster of shacks which constituted said township. I noticed three men outside an edifice which bore the legend Dirty Charlie's Saloon. Look at there. Ah. Good afternoon. Howdy. 
Saloon's closed. Oh? Yeah, voting day. Oh, I see. You voted yet? Uh, well, no. Uh... Buck, get out the voting paper. Uh, got it right here, Jim. Right here, mister. <laughs> I'm not a member of your community. Does that make a difference? Well, you're a human man. That's all the difference we need. Hey, Shorty, get off from the table. Let the stranger sit comfortable like. <laughs> all right, set, mister. Oh. oh. Make your mark, or you can write it out proper if you know how. Uh, one small point. Uh, what am I voting for? Or whom? You're voting for the school mom. That's what and who. Oh, and do I vote yes or no? Well, you vote yes, mister. You vote no, you're liable to end up lying toes down. Hey, you ain't been sent by them no good goose creek boys, have you? No, I've come from Laramie. Mm. Left there this morning. That's all right, then. Look here. It, it's not that I mind voting, but I'd like to know something about it. Well, he told you, mister. Get your mouth, just Shorty. A... Man's got a right to know. That's legal. Well, sir, now it's this way. We got a school mom, Rottenhead Gulch. A school district in Laramie, give her, and we aim to keep her. She's the prettiest thing you ever did see. Uh, Shorty, I'm telling you now, hobble your lip. Well, she is. Ain't she, Buck? Oh, man, she is a cow bunny, and that's for sure. <clears throat> now, like I say, we aim to keep her, and ain't no Goose Creek coyotes going to get her. And that's how come to vote. Now, the school district says if Goose Creek gets more votes than Rottenhead Gulch, she's going to be sent there. Ah, uh, now I see. So you vote yes. Yeah. But, um, is it legal? Well, sure it's legal. Of course, of course it is. Yeah. Look here, I, I'm in charge of voting. I say it's legal. <laughs> Anybody comes to this here town on voting day is a citizen of Rottenhead Gulch. Honorable like. Now, as mayor, I make you a citizen. Now you vote. All right. Hey, Buck, where at's the writing quill? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? We ain't had no voting since this morning. I guess maybe I left it in the saloon. Well, go get it. Sure, Jim. You know, I'm rather surprised to find a school teacher out here. I mean, uh, in a mining town as small as this. Uh, are there many children? Oh, shucks, mister. There ain't no kids around uh, shorty. here. Shorty. That... One of these here days, that leaky mouth of yarn is going to get you a case of slow. Well, it's a truth, Jim. A school teacher with no children to teach? Rather odd, isn't it? Well, now, sir, ain't nothing odd about it. <clears throat> we aim to get us some kids as soon as we get us some women to marry up with and have the kids. But how did the school district assign her here in the first place? Well, ain't nobody asked to find out. They did, and she's here, and she's going to stay. She's been learning us. There's 20 of us. Goes to school every night after work's done. Ain't that so, Jim? Yet there's a fact, mister. Now, maybe we ain't kids, but ain't but five of us can read and write so as you could notice it. And we figure we got a right to learn as well as any kid. Oh, I quite agree. But tell me, where does one meet this school teacher of yours? Well, I seen her a while back down to the creek washing some woman thing. I found it, Jim. Right here. Here's a writing quill. Where at's the ink? Oh. You know something? I want to tell you, that there buck, <clears throat> well, school ain't going to do him no good. You know, he ain't got enough brains to start with. <laughs> well, how many votes will you need to keep her here? Well, more than Goose Creek, that's for sure. You see, we got 20 votes in Rottenhead Gulch. Goose Creek's got maybe 30. So we just got to vote more than they do, so when the votes is counted, then we'll win. Hmm. Who, uh, counts the votes? Oh, back in Laramie. Well, as soon as the day is finished, we seal up the voting boxes and we take them up to Laramie. But won't they know that you've, uh, enlarged your voting? They must be aware of the population here. Shucks, no such thing. We just got to be sure we got more signed votes in Goose Creek. That's all. Well, how will you know that? Well, right now, it is kind of a problem. I got think, Jim. Right here. Thanks. There you go, mister. Good afternoon, boy. Well, well, now, good afternoon, Miss Jones. Howdy there. I've met this gentleman. Well, no, ma'am. He's just rode in. As soon as he's finished his business, he's going to be riding right out again. Miss Jones, isn't it? Yes. My name is Kendall, Miss Jones. J.B. Kendall. How do you do, Mr. Kendall? I have been uh, hearing quite a bit about you, Miss Jones. Oh, have you? I'd like very much to talk to you as soon as I've voted. Voted? But you can't vote. 
James Ponder. Oh, now, ma'am, this here is man's work. I will and not you... have a dishonest ballot. I told you that before. Oh, it ain't really dishonest, Miss Jones. Jim made this fellow an honorable citizen a rotten head gulf, didn't you? Well, I'm sure. very sorry, Mr. Kendall, but you cannot vote. Well, ma'am, you just don't understand these here political things. I understand that you're trying to stop the ballot box, and I will not have it. Has everybody in town voted? Oh, yes, ma'am. We sure have. Then in my presence, I want you to seal the box. Oh, Miss Jones. Oh, look, we can't do that. Look here, now, it, it ain't legal. Yeah, not till sundown. It just ain't legal. That's what it says right here in these here instructions from the school district in Laramie. Now, it just ain't legal. Not till sundown. If everybody's voted, it's legal. Seal the box. Yes, ma'am. That just don't seem right. Some of the other fellas didn't get to vote. Shorty, can you help me seal up this here now thing? Now, Miss Jones, uh, why don't you take Mr. Kendall and show him the schoolhouse? (laughs) I figure he'd like to see that. As a matter of fact, I would. All right. And no more voting. Is that understood? Oh, Oh, Miss Jones, I understand for sure. This way, Mr. Kendall. Are you a minor, too? (laughs) No. I'm a newspaper correspondent for the London Times. Isn't that strange? I had a feeling, not exactly, but you're very much like my brother. He's a reporter on a Nebraska paper. How strange. It gave me quite a start when I first saw you. Miss Jones, how long have you been here? In Rottenhead Gulch, three months. Weren't you surprised to find no children? Yes. Of course, they kept it from me for almost two weeks. I think I can understand why. Can you really, Mr. Kinder? Oh, I see. You mean because they wanted to learn themselves. Yes, you're right. And that's why you decided to stay? Yes. I suppose you think it curious that a woman devote her time to teaching 20 grown men. Not curious. Unusual, perhaps. This is the schoolhouse, Mr. Kendall. The men built it. They built the desks, benches, everything. Would you like to come inside? Very much. They even built a wooden floor, Mr. Kendall. Wooden floors are quite rare in these mining towns. I'm impressed more than I can say, Miss Jones. They have a great desire for education. I couldn't leave them. Not after they worked so hard to build this. And now? Unfortunately, word reached the people of Goose Creek that there was a school teacher here. They are a slightly larger community and feel that the school district board should assign me to their town. Besides which, there are two children in Goose Creek. I see. The board decided to have it settled by a vote. If enough residents of Goose Creek require my services and outvote the men of Rottenhead Gulch, I shall have to obey the decision of the board. Well, aren't there other teachers available? Yes. But that's the strange part of it. Neither town will accept anyone but me. Of course, I'm flattered. But I can't see that it really makes any difference. Can you? Uh, well, yes. In a way, you see... Here she is, boys. You, mister, elevate your hands high. <gasps> now, we don't aim to hurt you none, Miss Jones. You just come along with us and everything will be right fine. Mr. Kendall. Now, look here. Take care of him, Wes. I'll do that. In a moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. Another fascinating adventure is waiting for you on CBS Radio today, as most of these same stations present the FBI in Peace and War. Today, these law enforcers go after a pair of swindlers. You'll be amazed by the cleverness of the swindlers. You'll be thrilled to learn, however, that the FBI in peace and war is cleverer still. And now, we return you to the Anthony Ellis production of Frontier Gentlemen. I seem to remember a great roaring in my ears, which, as I awoke, turned out to be the voice of James Ponder. He was kneeling over me, and seeing my eyes open, redoubled his efforts to pour a great dollop of foul-tasting whiskey down my throat. Come on, Kendall, it'll clear your head. No, no, don't. There you go. I don't need it. What happened? Yeah, what? Hey, where is she, Kendall? Help me up. Well, where is she? We heard horses, and when we got here, there wasn't nobody except you. Yeah. There were... There were three or four men. Masked. They'd taken her. Well... Who was he? I don't know, except there was a father and son. The older man called the other Wes. Uh, Wes? Jim, that's Wes over to Goose Creek. Yeah, Stomp Peter's son, Wes. 
I might have noted. You reckon they carried her off to beat the vote? That's what they done. What good would it do? Well, I'll no. tell you what good. They figured they got more votes than we got, and even if we maybe voted more times than them, they got her in Goose Creek. And by the time the school district gets around to eyeballing around and maybe a recount, well, it'll be two, maybe three months. And by then, there's going to be a new school district board in, and the whole blame thing will have to start up again. Ooh, that no count stomp, Peters. He's about as welcome as a, a, a rattler in, in a dog town. I'll dally your tongue, Shorty. I'll go fetch them other boys out of the hills. we got to do something about this. Oh, we sure have, Jim. I tell you, ain't no Goose Creek sidewinder going to rustle our school, Marm. All right, hit the breeze, Shorty. And you too, Buck. Tell the boys to wear shooting irons. This here's going to be a powder-burning contest. An hour later... Twenty men, hard-bitten miners, some of them young, others grizzled, all armed to the teeth, were gathered in Dirty Charlie's saloon. Their mood was black, and it became blacker as Jim Ponder spoke to them. That's Tom Peters. He's a no-good, bullwindy, oily brock. He come here looking for our school, Mom, and he snatches her clean out of rotten head gulch. Well, he ain't going to get away with it. Because we're going over to Goose Creek, and we're going to shoot up that there place like you never seen. And we're going to get Miss Jones right back where she belongs, yeah? Where she belongs. And when we get through Stone Peters and that dingbat son of his, we're going to use them to trim a tree, yeah? yeah. Trim a tree. All right, now get your horses, boys, and rattle the house out of here. Yeah. Come on, Oh, certainly. Likely they'll be shooting. How far is it to Goose Creek? Oh, about half a mile. All right, now, let's go! Ho, ho! Hold on, hold on! Don't you imagine they'll be expecting you? Why, well, sure they'll be expecting us. It's going to be a real shoot-up. Wouldn't it have been better to surprise them? What for? They know we'd be coming after them. Supposing she gets hurt. Uh, well, now, you know, I didn't think of that. Hey, you figure maybe. Uh, with shooting, there's a chance. Boys, you hear what Kendall here says? Well, we don't want the school mom hurt. So you watch where you're shooting at you here. All right, now, we're going to take it real slow. Just around the next turn. All right, yeah. Hey, Kendall. You and me, we're going to keep an eye out for Miss Jones. Either one of us eyeballs or gets out of there fast, you hear? Right. There they are. Hey, look at that there, Kendall. Right in the middle of the street. Like you say, looks like they've been expecting us. We came upon Goose Creek with abrupt suddenness. The trail rounded a bend and became an elongated clearing lined on both sides with shacks. Perhaps a half dozen more than existed in Rottenhead Gulch. Between the dwellings and in the middle of the street were piled boxes, barrels, and two overturned wagons. Behind this barricade, we could see the figures of men and a reflection of sunlight on steel. Up to this point, even with my headache, the affair had been rather difficult to take seriously, but the complexion had radically changed. When we were no more than 20 yards from the defenders, Jim Ponder held up his hand. Uh, oh, 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 yeah. Stop, Peter! What do you want, Ponder? We come to get Miss Jones and take her back to her rightful home. She's in her rightful home. Guess where she is. And you're a liar. Want to start trouble? We ain't going back without the school, Marm. Maybe you ain't going back because you'll be shaking hands with St. Peter. Let me talk to him. This ain't no time for chewing the cud. Let's start throwing lead. Shorty, shut your mouth, will you? They're in a better position than we are. Oh, shucks, we could ride right over them. If you lived that long. What's the matter, boys? Afraid to take the big jump? Come out, Peters. You can bring another man with you. Jim Ponder and I'll meet you between the lines. Who are you? The chap who was with Miss Jones. I told you, Pa. I told you he wasn't dead. All right. You and Ponder, get off your horses. Come forward slow. You watch it, Jim. Now, don't you fret. Hey, boys, they start something. You go in and finish it, yeah? Well, oh, let's go, Kendall. Uh. What's your name, mister? Kendall. This here's my boy, Wes. We figured he killed you. I told you I didn't, Pa. 
What do you got to say? Where's Miss Jones? In the schoolhouse we got built for her. Is she all right? Sure, she's all right. Ain't nobody gonna hurt that pretty gal. No, sir. Well, we aim to take her back, Stomp Peters. You're off your mental reservation if you think you can do it, Ponder. You ain't got no right to school, ma'am, no how. But there ain't a kid in that broken down flea bitten town of yours. Well, that don't matter. We aim to get some by and by. School district, give her to us. We just outvoted you. She's ours now. You better set your gun a going, Stomp Peters. Well, that what you want? I'm willing. Draw. Now, wait, wait. That won't settle anything. Well, I've never seen a better way. You get him, Paul. Cut down this here Kendall fella. Young man, I owe you something for that clout on the head, but I have no desire to kill you. <laughs> now, both of you, keep your hands in sight. You too, Jim. Huh? Hey, what's ailing you, mister? I'm on your side. Then keep your gun holster. There's no need for shooting. Uh, Peters, tell one of your men to bring Miss Jones out here. I ain't going to do it. Sam, go get the school, ma'am. Bring her out. Just what you got in mind, Kendall. You'll see. Well, it better be good. Of course, if it ain't. If and Stomp Peter's boys don't get you, me or mine will. Ain't nobody pulls a gun on me and gets away with it. I think it's for the best. What are you men doing? Well, howdy, howdy, ma'am. We come to get you out of this here pest hole. (laughs) We come to save you. I've had enough of this nonsense. First, I'm forced to accompany Mr. Peters against my will. Now your men are lined up waiting to kill each other. I will not have it. Do you understand? Uh, yes, ma'am. Mr. Kendall, put away that gun. All of you, put down those guns. All right, boys. Sure, what you said. Now, put them away. Now, Mr. Kendall, I should be obliged if you will escort me back to Laramie. La- Laramie? You, you going to go back to Laramie? Oh, she's going to Laramie. Oh, Miss Jones. It's gone too far. If this is the example you set your children... Uh, Miss Jones, could I have a word with you in private? I really don't see that that... I think you will. Gentlemen, if you'll excuse us. Oh, she can't go back to Larry. He said he could have her. Looks like there ain't nobody going to have her no more. Dreadful, dreadful grammar. Double, triple, negative... Miss Jones, there may be a solution, if you're willing. I don't see any way. I really don't. If they could share you? Share me? I mean your teaching... The towns are only a half mile apart. It might be possible. No, Mr. Kendall. My mind's made up. Today is the final straw. Miss Jones, think of the schoolhouse in Rottenhead Gulch. You know, it was rather touching. They've built a schoolhouse for me here in Goose Creek as well. The floor isn't quite as good, but... They need you, Miss Jones. You think so? I do. Look at them. They are like children, aren't they? (laughs) Very much like children. I think perhaps you're right, Mr. Kendall. But I wonder what the school district board will think. Well, I imagine a joint petition from both towns ought to settle the problem. Yes. Yes, very likely. All right. If the men will agree to your plan... I'm sure they will. All right. I'll stay. Kendall. Yes? While I was being held captive, a rather terrible thought occurred to me. It is the education that I can give them, isn't it? I mean, there are no baser thoughts involved. Perhaps because I am a woman? Miss Jones, were it not for the fact that I have already completed my school and university curricula... I should not hesitate to avail myself of the opportunity to better my education. Thank you, Mr. Kendall. You've relieved my mind. The matter was settled most amicably. And readers of the London Times will be interested to know that an extraordinarily pretty woman by the name of Miss Annabella Jones is now entrusted with the education of some 53 adults and two children in the mining towns of Goose Creek and Rottenhead Gulch in Wyoming Territory. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Jack Crucian, Virginia Gregg, Vic Perrin, Jack Moyles, Harry Bartell, and Eddie Firestone. Today's 10th 
tonight's episode of Gunsmoke proves no gambling stakes were too high along the frontier. For thrill upon thrill, hear what happens in the pioneer days of Dodge City when a man's life hangs upon the outcome of a horse race. That's on CBS Radio's Gunsmoke later on today. Join us again next week for another report from The Frontier Gentleman. Dan Coverley speaking. <laughs>